Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Michael Cannon. I'm the Director of Health Policy Studies here at Cato. And we're very excited to have with us uh, two co-authors, co-editors, and contributors to a recent book on health policy. Uh, the title of it is Seemed Like a Good Idea, Alchemy versus Evidence-Based Approaches to Healthcare Management Innovation. Now, uh, there is no, uh, there's been an, a movement in health policy over the last couple of decades, in, in, in medicine, I should say, over the last couple of decades. We call it evidence-based medicine. The idea is that everything that doctors do should be subject, uh, should be uh, the, uh, the application of uh, rigorous evidence uh, uh, to patient care. Uh, the, there are estimates that lots and lots of what doctors, uh, of the care that doctors provide, uh, does not have a, uh, a, a, a rigorous body of evidence showing that it works. Uh, while the Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, requires large randomized controlled trials before a drug can come to market, it is uh, often the case that lots of uh, the care that uh, that that uh, doctors provide is not subject uh, to that high a standard of evidence. And leaving aside the wisdom of having the FDA regulate uh, market access for drugs with, uh, and imposing such a high standard, it is also the case that uh, while much of medicine lacks that sort of evidence base, certainly lots of uh, uh, public policy decisions and decisions about how to finance and deliver health care and whether those uh, the approaches that insurance companies, governments, uh, and uh, healthcare managers take uh, it are um, are subject uh, or, or uh, come from uh, a uh, a body of evidence that shows that those approaches actually work. Uh, the uh, our guest speakers today are the uh, uh, co-editors and contributors uh, to the book, Seemed Like a Good Idea. Uh, they are uh, Mark Pauley. Each of our speakers holds a number of positions at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, they are Mark Pauley. Mark uh, uh, is a professor in the Wharton School. He's a Bendine Professor Emeritus in both the Department of Healthcare Management and Business and in the Department of Public Policy, and a professor of economics in the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Lawton Robert Burns, also with the Wharton School, uh, is the James Ju Jin Kim Professor, a professor of healthcare management and a professor of management. And he's a co-director of the Roy and Diana Vagelis Program in Life Sciences and Management. Now, contributors to this book, uh, which uh, runs the gamut of uh, uh, evaluating the evidence base behind all sorts of aspects of patient care uh, from uh, uh, from care coordination to hospital to home care transitions to healthcare disparities. Uh, the contributors to this book include professors of medicine, nursing, uh, economics, and ethics. They have affiliations at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania and the National Academy of Medicine. And to get, get an overview of the book, uh, I'm going to turn things over now uh, to our guest speakers. Uh, we will be taking questions from both the online and in-person audiences. Uh, the online audience could join the conversation and submit questions directly on the event webpage, uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, or on Twitter using the hashtag Cato Health. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to uh, Mark uh, to walk us through uh, uh, to walk us through the book and its findings. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, so. Um uh, what, we're, what Rob and I have decided to do is I'm going to provide an introduction to the book and tell you a little bit of the backstory. Uh, that's what they always do when they interview, I always ask when they interview a Hollywood director. And, uh, so uh, since I was the director, we put on a play here, there at Penn uh, with, a, with a bunch of uh, our faculty colleagues. So since I was the director, I guess I'm going to tell you what my motivation was, whether or not my actors always carried it out. Uh, and then I'm going to also provide a summary of two, there, uh, there are in the book uh, uh, eight chapters dealing with substantive in questions in healthcare management, uh, uh, primarily asking about the presence or absence of evidence for particular innovations 
which, uh, or, or innovations that might solve particular problems uh, in healthcare management. I'm gonna summarize two of the chapters, then um, I'll let Rob summarize as many of the remaining ones as he wishes, but I think it'd probably be about two. So you, you, if you don't have to buy the book, you'll get 50% of the <laughs> remarks here, but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, other, but you won't get the footnotes. So uh, that, that, that's gonna be a big loss. So let me say a little bit about how, uh, uh, and I'll be pretty self-indulgent here, uh, how, 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 we came, how we came, and I'm gonna probably use mostly the pontifical we here, meaning I, uh, to put this book together. Uh, I really had two objectives uh, in mind. One was, um, uh, as Mike mentioned, I'm now emeritus professor, and uh, this was, book was started before I crossed the Great Divide, and now I've crossed it. Uh, there is life on the other side, I'm happy to say, but uh, it was a bit of a challenge. And one of my thoughts was I have had the great pleasure of working with so many um, knowledgeable people in healthcare, both at the Wharton School uh, and uh, my colleagues in the Perelman School of Medicine and my former PhD students who are now physicians and leaders in the Perelman School of Medicine. I thought, uh, you know what I'd like to do is at least get a distillation of their great thoughts about these problems in healthcare management that I've been working on for more than 50 years. L let's get them down on paper. So, uh, that, and to my surprise, or maybe uh, my underestimation of my own persuasive powers, I did work my way through college selling ladies' shoes, so I guess I must be a good salesman. But in any case, I managed to persuade my colleagues to agree to, uh, to write chapters in their area of expertise confronting various kinds of questions in healthcare management. And uh, so now, um, uh, if it's late at night and uh, either I can't get to sleep or I want to get to sleep, uh, I can pick up the book and read some of the chapters and find uh, the questions that I have worried about for so many years, uh, at least answered there as far as it's possible to answer them. So that's, that's sort of the main uh, dividend, I think, from having the book that you have in one place, the reflections with footnotes of uh, a, a set of, of the world's greatest experts on these questions uh, to refer to and to at least, if, if you worry about them as much as I do, you can read the chapters and the chapter and then you're way ahead of everybody else because you know pretty much what has been up to this point ever been said about that topic and then you're free to come up with your own ideas uh, and see, but you don't want to, you, at least this will avoid reinventing the wheel. The other uh, reason was even more self-interested. So Rob and I and our colleagues in uh, healthcare management and health services research, we, um, uh, I think, are fairly proud of ourselves for uh, doing studies where we look at interventions in healthcare and we try to evaluate them. Uh, and um, most of the time, as you'll see in the book, unfortunately, I might as well give you the bad news, <laughs> they don't work. Occasionally they do, where work can mean, in the best of all possible worlds, this intervention lowered cost and improved outcomes. Sometimes it means sort of an intermediate stage, which economists still like, where costs went up. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the t you, you haven't gotten rid of Warren Buffett's tapeworm that's eating the economy, but health went up even more so uh, economists would say on balance we're a happier nation even if we spend more on health care as long as the benefit we get from health care is worth the cost if it's in the jargon cost effective but the majority of innovations of ideas that seemed like a good idea and on paper or in practice or when uh, when when presented at a meeting sound like they're a good idea haven't worked now that's in healthcare where that in a way is not a shock uh, uh, something more than 90% of new ideas in pharmaceuticals never work. So why should it be any different or any better in healthcare management? So we should be uh, inured to um, disappointment, but still, well, back to our gripe. Our gripe is we put a lot of effort into writing papers showing things either do or don't work. Then we run the gauntlet of refereeing. You got to get them in a, a professional journal and where do they get these thick-headed referees who don't realize genius when they see it, uh, when they read our papers and force us to go back and revise them. And we finally get our paper out 
either uh, advocating or condemning an idea that everybody's talking about or might be talking about, and then what do we hear? Well, you know, crickets, right? So <laughs> nothing much happens, and, and the, uh, at least most of the time, there are fortunately, I guess, exceptions, but the, they are exceptions rather than the rule. And so we thought that it would be uh, uh, good to um, make the case for why people in healthcare management actually out there running the railroad and delivering the care ought to pay attention to what we academic scribblers are scribbling about rather than uh, allowing us just to, to do it for our own uh, personal be benefit and edification. And of course, since all of the authors already had tenure, they already ran through that gauntlet, so what other reason is there to publish unless you think that the world may benefit from it? Okay, so let me see here. Now I'm, there we go. So uh, it seemed like a good idea was the question that we asked and um, uh, the, uh, the uh, obviously that um, uh, uh, depends on what do you mean by a good idea. I've already kind of given you the economist litany. There's those good ideas that save money and improve outcomes. There's those ideas that cost money, but the outcomes are worth it. And then there's uh, those ideas. Some of them are um, totally worthless, but actually there are a fair number, and this is one of the dilemmas, I think, in health policy in the United States. There are a fair number of ideas that are good in the sense that they improve health, at least some, maybe a little for some people, they're just not worth it. Uh, they're not worth the cost of either what um, a drug company might be thinking of charging or what, uh, uh, or, or, or what the real resource costs are of that innovation. So uh, that is um, uh, the, the, uh, the definition that we're after. Uh, and our idea was to, um, uh, uh, um, I think I'm gonna have to pull out my own copy of the slides here, if I can find it, since I can't see, <laughs> I can't see it from here. Uh, I, I will say, you may be disappointed that, uh, also, I might as well get the disappointment out of the way. We're going to talk about the delivery of healthcare goods and services and not about pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceuticals are getting all the buzz. I know everybody's waiting on the uh, edge of their chairs for the September uh, announcement of the uh, uh, set of the top 10 drugs that the government is going to put a cap on. Uh, it's gonna be a lot more interesting than the Republican presidential candidates debate. Let me tell you, watch for that list. But today we're going to talk about health services, which a reason to talk about them is that's where most of the money goes following the Willie Sutton principle. Something like uh, more than half, probably close to 60 to 70%, depending on how you define it, of healthcare spending occurs either in a connection with physician expenditures or hospital expenditures. So um, I don't, I think that's in my briefcase. So uh, if I have a copy of the slide. So, um, <laughs> okay. Well, there may, there may, I, you can also see it behind you, yeah. but it's oh, much okay. greater. All right. Bring that well, thing closer. Yeah, so I think I already went through this. Good. Uh, yeah, so I could just wing it probably. I've got it all memorized. Okay, so it uh, seemed like a good idea. And, and, and uh, with innovations, with innovations, seemed like a good idea. What we would like to see happen, we being, again, the pontifical we, but also the uh, powers that be, or the dark force, or whatever it is, the, the, the benevolent dark force. Uh, we don't pay nearly enough <laughs> attention to that these days. The benevolent dark force would, of economists, of course, would like to see interventions with, with an evidence base adopted if they are cost effective, though, I have to add that. And then nobody wants to sit next to me at a dinner party after I say that, but they have to, they have to not only be effective, uh, and evidence that they're effective, but they have to be effective enough. But innovations without an evidence base, uh, in, and some innovations with an evidence base are not adopted, 
But what we observe in actual healthcare management out there in the field is that managers, including a lot of our MBA students that we have foisted on the world and go out there and manage your healthcare, it's those MBAs that MDs have a visceral uh, hatred for, uh, saying no, and they're wimpy guys with glasses and things like that, but those are our students. <laughs> they're out there thinking about how to manage healthcare, but they often are not paying attention to what their professors have either said or have are most recently telling them. And we uh, originally started this book with saying, that's a crime. And we ought to try to shame people into and give them a tool to help them use evidence-based management. So here's what they uh, typically do. Uh, Rob can say more about this. There's a lot of magical thinking. If it seemed like a good idea, it must, it's likely to work. Uh, the purported best practices, well, if everybody else is doing it, everybody else, my mom used to say, is jumping over a cliff. That's best practice. <laughs> do you want to do that? Uh, benchmarking with peers is a version of this same thing. Bandwagging is another version of the same thing. Herd mentality is yet another version of the same thing. Uh, personal experience, and we didn't put it down there, but they con consult various parts of their viscera, seat of the pants, gut feeling, uh, to see whether this seems like a good idea or not. What you get in the book, I think I've already mentioned, uh, the top line is the top line there. The essay summarized the evidence and uh, some careful discussion of what constitutes evidence. So, uh, as you'll see, one of the learnings that I got from this was humility. What we thought and what we learned, we were originally came on as what, we, what I've late, lately called the evidence police. People who say, unless this is what Mike mentioned, uh, evidence-based medicine, unless you have evidence, you shouldn't be doing that, doctor. We, uh, 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 healthcare managers who aren't, uh, my, our moms all wanted us to go to med school, but somehow we took a wrong turn. We ended up in the healthcare field at not being physicians, although some of us wear white lab coats around the office, I tell you. Uh, anyway, what, whatever we should be doing, we should be uh, replicating evidence-based medicine uh, to say that only if there's evidence should you do it. And, um, and, um, and people don't do that is basically the punchline here. But, but uh, at least I, or we, the typical we learned humility here because I came to realize that for many decisions in healthcare management, and for that matter, if you've ever been a patient, and I suspect many of us have, you probably come to realize too, for many decisions in medicine, nobody really knows what the best thing is to do. And uh, that's the right thing to say, but at least physicians aren't supposed to say that. Uh, they're not, you don't pay them to tell you they don't know. And uh, you know, as somebody once said to me, I came all the way to Orlando for this conference for you just to tell me that there's no magic bullet. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 we people in health management don't know either. Uh, the, the main punchline, I'll go over this quickly. My, my uh, earworm here is Kenny Rogers saying, knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. And that's a decision that most healthcare managers have to make on a daily basis when it comes to these innovations because often the evidence is not conclusive. Of course, if the evidence is conclusive, that would be what Cass Sunstein, who worked for the Obama administration, advocated. What I, in a world with no uh, limitations on resources or brilliance, would have advocated, then wait for the evidence. But a lot of times you have to make decisions without waiting for the evidence. And um, I think we put it on the slide here, although it's not in the song. Uh, sometimes you have to ask for a few more cards. The analogy here is you have to ask for more information or to put it even further, you have to ask, is it worthwhile to wait or to spend money to gather more information? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two chapters in the book uh, as a humble person. Uh, but but one of the first one here is actually one I'm not going to be humble about because it mostly relates to the work of my colleague in the nursing school, Mary Naylor, and it has to do with are there better ways of transitioning frail patients from hospital to home? And if this has happened to a relative or even worse, if it's happened to yourself, you know what happens on the last day you're in the hospital. A nurse comes in and reads often in an unemotional voice your instructions 
for when you go home to you and your caregiver. Meanwhile, you're gathering up the potted plants and uh, the bottles of medicine and so forth, uh, and uh, you're supposed to remember that. And research shows that people don't remember it. They don't remember what they were told as they were leaving the hospital. Then the other thing that happens is you'll get a phone call, maybe a couple of them, maybe more than you want, actually, after you're home. Uh, some of them robocalls, some of them actual people asking you how you're doing and you're supposed to report back. That's sort of the state of the art in uh, transitional care. Uh, lecture plus uh, phone calls. What uh, Mary Naylor, Mary pioneered, and I had the pleasure to work with her on it, is a much more intensive, personalized way of transitioning people to home where they were connected with an advanced practice nurse while they were in the hospital, and that nurse was required to check on them within 40 hours after discharge to home, and then check on them periodically, either by phone or preferably in person, uh, uh, for uh, 30 to 60 to 90 days. Uh, and compared, uh, and we ran a randomized controlled trial, randomly assigning people either to the advanced practice nurse or to the lecture plus a phone call. Uh, and what we found was it improved outcomes and reduced costs. It mostly reduced costs by reducing readmissions, as you might imagine, and also by reducing uh, emergency room visits, and it improved outcomes by improving the quality of life of patients. So. When it happens that, you know, mother's having problems, she's home from the hospital, they didn't tell us what to do or we can't remember, and we've got all these pills we brought home, but we don't know which ones are the right ones, you have somebody you could call who would straighten it out and even show up at your house to do it. And it was cost effective in the most fundamental way. It actually produced more benefit uh, and less cost. So. It, we published that paper. We published several versions of this. Not crickets exactly, but not a uh, world beating a path to our door either. Why not? The answer is, uh, uh, at least in large part, there's a couple of answers. One is thick-headed hospital managers. But the other part of the answer is financial incentives. So hospitals make money off of admitting people. They don't make, and readmitting people, not as much as when they're admitted for the first place, but they make something most of the time. And um, if you discourage people from coming back to the hospital, you're not gonna make as much profit. So uh, it, the law has been changed now so that there's a penalty for hospitals which have unusually high readmission rates, but it's not high enough if the hospital has empty beds. So the um, hospitals that were actually interested and are interested this day in implementing our program are hospitals whose beds are so full that they want to clean them out so they can have more interesting and more lucrative patients in them, not these readmits. But overall, the financial incentives have discouraged the implementation of what truly was a good idea. So I only have a minute here for, uh, see the time. I think I've talked for more than seven minutes. In any case, example two, I'll stop when I get to the end of what I have to say and turn it over to Rob. So yeah, so the uh, example, t t uh, so that was an example of a glorious triumph that was ignored so far by the world, although as, and this sort of is my lead in, as payment systems have migrated from paying per hospital admission, so your profit matters, toward paying for the health of a population. Now, if you're paid for the health of a population and you don't get more money, or you don't get that much more money for a readmit, you have more of an incentive as a hospital manager, a financial incentive to discourage readmissions because they do cost something. Uh, lime jello costs something, and if you, you, you're gonna guest serve that to the patients, you can avoid doing that by readmitting them. So this, the um, second example that I want to say something about that I worked with Ralph Muller, who is the former CEO of the Penn Health System, has to do with uh, 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 value-based payment. So everybody knows, except me, uh, <laughs> that fee-for-service is an evil way and an inefficient way to pay for health care. Why is fee-for-service an inefficient way? Because it rewards sellers of health care the more they do. So as, at least as a way of holding down healthcare costs, that seems like a dumb thing to reward people for doing more. The, however, what economics says, if I put on my economist hat here, or I left it at home, but wherever it is, uh, uh, 
uh, what, what economics says is, wait a minute, there's a cost as well as a revenue from bringing in someone for a new service. And if you're a worn out physician, especially a worn out primary care physician, you m may well decide not to render service to patients if the price is not high enough. So my view is, is there's nothing wrong with fee for service, it's just that in Medicare in particular, uh, but in general in the US healthcare system, for our fees are too high. We're paying too high a price for things that we don't really want that much of, and then we get mad because doctors are doing too much of the things that we're paying them more to do. So we could improve fee-for-service, but the alternative is a bundled system in some fashion, either capitation, bundle everything, or bundle small payments. Uh, and isn't that sound, does that sound like a better idea? It sounds like a good idea. Uh, um, I guess, uh, since I don't have much time left, I have to say it hasn't worked out that way. In the best case, which is bundled payment for joint replacement surgery, uh, savings were about 4%. Uh, in other cases where either bundled payment have been used or capitation has been used in systems that haven't been raised on capitation, it, it doesn't seem to have done much good. Now, if you go to uh, systems that were originally based on capitation, like the Kaiser system, it does seem to save money, although not lower the rate of growth of healthcare spending, which is kind of important to say. The last thing I'll say about value-based payment, though, is in connection with joint payment. One of the categories of services that's blowing the lid off Medicare's budget is replacement surgery. Why is that? Well, at least if you ask me to guess, it's because payments to orthopedic surgeons for replacing worn out hinges in our bodies as they age are too high. Cut the payments and they'll stop doing it. Of course, you will have a procession of orthopedic surgeons on the steps of the Capitol uh, uh, protesting against that, so there's, uh, there's actually a way to buy them off. A soil bank for surgeons, effectively. If anybody remembers the soil bank, they'll know what that joke means. So there is a solution, but the solution is uh, fraught with, uh, fraught with uh, peril. So, thank you. Um, Mark's an economist. <coughs> I'm in the uh, area of management. We come at this topic from totally different perspectives. I think that's one reason why we work so well together. Um, I've been toiling away looking at healthcare management innovations for the last 40 years. And over time, I keep doing paper after paper after paper and discovering that most things don't work. And then I'm beginning to wonder, hasn't this sunk in with the rest of my colleagues and especially with all the practitioners out in healthcare? Don't they realize that most of the things that they're doing doesn't work? One problem is uh, they don't know the literature. Another problem is we do a lousy job of communicating the literature to them. And third, what we're basically saying are a bunch of inconvenient truths to practitioners who think they know what they're doing. Um, so in the last 20 years, Mark and I have written a series of papers basically debunking a lot of the favorite strategies and change uh, initiatives pursued mainly by hospitals. I'll just run down the list. Integrated delivery networks, price transparency, accountable care organizations, the move from uh, volume to value, and most recently, uh, cross-market hospital mergers, written five papers, and none of these things meet, even come close to meeting the standard of having an evidence base, and yet everybody out there is doing them. And so after a while, we'd be, we get a little testy, uh, and yet you don't want to be around a testy academic, um, but you know, so, We've gone, in some of our more recent articles and in this book, we've gone on a rant. But it's an evidence-based rant. And so, and it's, it's not just like Dennis Miller. And it's an evidence-based rant saying, what the heck is going on here? And I'm gonna talk about two other innovations that are going on right now that are in the book to complement the two that Mark did. Um, did I skip, go forward once? Yeah, one is care coordination. Care coordination has got to be one of the favorite go-to strategies that everybody talks about. Everybody has talked about them so often since the 1980s uh, when Barbara Starfield at uh, Johns Hopkins wrote a book on it uh, that they, they talk about it so much they think it's true. What we did in this book, uh, myself and a co-author, is we went through all the evidence 
on whether or not care coordination works. And in fact, it doesn't. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but boy, it sure doesn't come up to the standard of an academic evidence-based intervention strategy. And there are lots of reasons why. But the problem is everybody acts as if it's true. And if, you know, I learned from Ross Perot back in 1992, if everybody says it enough, people assume it's true. And I think that's what's been going on here. A second strategy, and something that I spent a lot of my career, unfortunately, studying, is vertical integration. Horizontal integration, by contrast, is where you merge hospitals with hospitals, doctors with doctors. Vertical integration is where you're merging different stages in the chain of production. So physicians with hospitals, hospitals with post-acute care. Uh, uh, and we have several examples of these things over time, which are held out as the solution, the silver bullet in healthcare. The Kaiser model is always held out as the solution. There's only one problem. Kaiser hasn't been able to replicate its own model. And so now they're merging with things that are not Kaiser-like. Uh, integrated delivery networks, we've talked about those. Uh, accountable care organizations, that was ushered in after 2010. And then uh, the more recent version of that, a clinically integrated network, CINs. Uh, and what you get here is a stream of innovations, all of which have a TLA, which means a three-letter acronym. So IDN, ACO, CIN. If you see a three-letter acronym, it's likely BS. And so Mark and I wrote two blogs four years ago on how to detect BS in healthcare. They're inc it's incredibly useful stuff. As soon as you see these phrases, start running for the hills, protect your wallet, shy away from investment, because you can probably bet the stuff isn't going to work. I'll just give you a couple of illustrations, if I can get this thing to work. So this is one thing that's going on right now. And this is... I, was, I testified in the Senate earlier this spring. This is one thing that's you know, purportedly scaring a lot of the Senate and House committees to death. Look at what's happening with vertical integration along the drug supply chain. You, know, you have insurers merging with PBMs, having specialty pharmacies, retail pharmacies, provider clinics, and you have seven of these you know, flying fortresses here, you know, and accounting for the, probably the vast majority of healthcare spending, and it scares the hell out of everybody. The question is, is there anything there? And so right now we're working on that. My feeling is that the rhetoric in the fear outweigh any sensible thinking about this. And if most people would recognize that vertical integration hasn't worked in healthcare since the early 1990s. We have 30 years of evidence on this. That's one of the chapters in our book, and yet people still do this stuff. So it begs the question, why are they still doing this stuff? It was on a prior slide that Mark showed, you know, bandwagon effects, bandwagon effects, herd mentalities. My favorite one is FOMO, fear of missing out. You know, if they're doing it, boy, my, my board's telling me I better do it because we don't want to get left behind. There's so many irrational, not evidence-based reasons for why all these things are going on um, that it just boggled the mind. And unfortunately, this is where the alchemy comes in. We're spending all of our money in healthcare pursuing strategies and change efforts that have no evidence base, are probably gonna to lead to failure, and yet nobody calls these people on the carpet. That's what our book is trying to do. I'll stop here. Okay. <clears throat> all right, thank you both very much. So uh, you've laid out uh, an empirical case uh, about uh, you know, describing what's going on in healthcare markets, describing the lack of evidence uh, that exists. So what I would like to do is, I got a couple questions that are, that are more empirical, more descriptive before we get into some policy questions because this is the Cato Institute, we do you know, like to ask those policy questions. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, uh, what percent uh, of what healthcare managers do would you, in your estimation, uh, does the evidence say uh, works versus doesn't work uh, versus we don't have evidence to, uh, to tell us whether this stuff works or not? What percentage of you know, what healthcare managers do falls into each of those three I'll, I'll take a stab at that because you began the conversation about evidence-based medicine. Only about 20% of medicine has an evidence base. But even in that 20%, doctors don't have to follow it. 
and oftentimes don't follow it because they exercise their clinical judgment, right or wrong. But it's 20% evidence-based. When you get to management, we talk about evidence-based management. There's even less empirical evidence there. There are no randomized controlled trials of managerial interventions. But we have even less than 20% of what managers do has an evidence base. But I'll be honest with you, most managers don't care. <laughs> so at least 80%, there's no evidence to support it. Of, the, of whatever's left, less than 20%, how much of that, uh, uh, is there evidence to show that it works? And how much of it is uh, stuff that the evidence show doesn't work, but they keep doing it? I think it's the latter. I mean, the, we have colleagues out at Stanford who wrote a book 20, 30 years ago um, on what were called damn lies in health in management. And most of the strategies that managers pursue has no evidence base. In fact, there is a counter evidence base for it. And yet, these are the most popular strategies that executives follow. And I have, I think it goes back to Mark's earlier slide that, you know, people are just following what other people do. And if those smart people over there are doing it, it must be good for us. I'd be a little more charitable. I'd say, well, what do you mean by work compared to what? So that's why the book focused on innovations. So if you, so, the, uh, you know, I would have formulated your question, Mike, as what percentage of innovations that managers do are evidence-based? And there, I think I'd agree with Rob that um, only 20% are and 80% are not. And of the 20% that are, and we explore this in the book, again, here I'm feeling bad about our MBA students, but most managers get their information on evidence from consulting firms, not from reading the literature, because reading the literature is hard and it's boring and uh, and have, maybe ask your staffer to do it, but uh, and consulting firms, um, uh, are, some of my best friends are consultants, but uh, well, we looked at <clears throat> what consulting firms say about transitional care, because we think we know what the right, the truth is on transitional care. And I guess the best way to summarize the white paper that we read from a consulting firm on that is we give it C plus, B minus, if it was submitted by a student, because mostly because it failed to differentiate between evidence that's rigorous and evidence that's a before and after study that somebody published in um, Barron's Magazine or something like that. So the uh, distinction between high quality and low quality evidence in uh, healthcare management is often not made. Evidence, if there is any, <coughs> is uh, a dimly remembered uh, garbled study that was done of before and after. Yeah. I, I actually do have one picture that kind of <laughs> answers your question. And this is, this is, what's, this is what happens. There's the, what academics have, have studied and published, and then there are what managers like to do. And they're like two ships passing in the middle of the night, and each one ignores the other. I think two ships passing in the night, they do have some interaction, usually is where the, uh, the expression comes from, but uh, then they do uh, ultimately part ways. So my next question, though, <laughs> is a bit of a, uh, a wonkier sort of economics question, which is, uh, <coughs> if you had to guess, what percentage of the optimal levels of each of the following does the U.S. health sector currently produce? One experimentation, innovations with different models of delivering uh, uh, and organizing the delivery of, of health care. Uh, how close do we come to uh, the optimal level of that sort of innovation? Because that's how we make progress on cost, and that's how we make progress on quality. And then evidence, or research and measurement of the effects of those delivery innovations. So uh, uh, the uh, the economists will tell you that, when, at least when it comes to evidence, maybe even with innovations, these things have public goods qualities, and so uh, uh, because the person who undertakes the investment uh, might not capture all of the benefit, they tend to uh, people tend to underinvest in these, and we don't get the socially optimal level of these sorts of things. But imagine you could, you did know the socially optimal level of. Uh, of, of experimentation with uh, uh, innovations in uh, or healthcare organization and delivery, and research that evaluates whether that stuff actually works or not. How far short of those optimal levels does the U.S. health sector currently fall? 
Well, so I once wrote a paper whose title was Wissonomics in Healthcare, <laughs> and it uh, commented that private insurers, commercial insurers, seem uh, t to, uh, despite what would appear to be strong financial incentives to experiment with ways to control healthcare spending, don't. And the reason is because, and the reason I hypothesized, <coughs> although there, uh, there's no evidence on this, is that they're afraid of backlash from uh, my former senator from Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter, <coughs> used to take off on the health insurers all the time, uh, uh, and others uh, do as well, and, uh, and uh, so would uh, uh, much of the uh, policy sphere. So uh, the place <coughs> where I think we do have some, um, I can't quantify it, but some inkling of experimentation is in Medicare Advantage programs, where they are trying, although I would encourage them to be much bolder, in uh, alternative ways of paying physicians and alternative ways of organizing the delivery of health care and alternative ways, especially of arranging networks of healthcare professionals and healthcare institutions to deliver care in a more cost-effective way. But the, um, uh, uh, in my uh, nirvana world, uh, competition would work in the way Hayek thought about it that, and, um, and Frank Knight, that competition would work to stimulate experimentation to come up with the answer to these questions, rather than having people like Rob and me come up with the answers, uh, which we do our best, but you'd think that uh, the people who actually deliver the care would have stronger incentives to do so. Now, I do have to say, at the University of Pennsylvania, we have an innovation center in the Perlman School of Medicine that has come up with some imaginative things, although I also have to say they're relatively small scale, like changing what doctors check on boxes so they don't check boxes that are useless. But uh, maybe it's the, maybe the case is that if we are going to uh, reduce healthcare spending, well, we'll never reduce healthcare spending, but if we're going to reduce the growth of it, it'll be by small steps rather than large ones. Let me add, you know, um, to their credit, uh, CMS and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation spent the last 10 years or so, maybe longer, uh, doing experiments on what might improve the cost or quality of health care. Um, the outgoing director of CMMI published a short article, I believe it was in the New England Journal, saying the vast majority of those things didn't work. At least they were honest enough to acknowledge that most of those things didn't work. A handful did. They didn't produce a whole lot of savings, but at least we learned something from it. My biggest problem with a lot of that is that the biggest chunk of spending of CMS goes into a program that we know doesn't work, and that's the accountable care organizations. And Mark and I wrote an article 11 years ago predicting that this kind of thing was going to be troublesome. Nobody paid any attention to it. There were other people out there saying the same thing. But even when we have the evidence, we go against what we know doesn't work and yet still plow more money into it. I think it's important to distinguish between uh, uh, a concept, and I think CMS's implementation, the Medicare program's implementation of that concept. I, I, yeah. I can think of reasons why an accountable care organization would work in a marketplace and meet people's needs, but the way that Medicare goes about trying to encourage these really makes absolutely no sense. Because what Medicare says is uh, basically we're going to try to uh, integrate the delivery of health care and provide one uh, point of accountability that patients can uh, uh, choose and evaluate, uh, but we're only going to, uh, but the only, uh, the Rules for participating in this are such that it's good. participation for providers is going to be voluntary. So no provider is going to go into this program unless they know they're going to make more money, money which means there's no way that this program is going to save Medicare or taxpayers money at yeah, all. So no I way. think it's important to distinguish between that and uh, the, uh, the concept of something like an accountable care organization and Medicare's implementation of it. Uh, but Medicare has been doing a lot of those things, and it, that was a very useful uh, 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 article by uh, the outgoing head of CMMI and the Congressional Budget Office has published similar things about experiments that they've run. But I'm glad that Mark brought up competition, 
because I want to talk about that. I want to talk about maybe some of the barriers to the sorts of competition that might be frustrating both these sorts of innovations and uh, the generation of evidence about what works and what doesn't. Here at Cato, we care a lot about uh, those sorts of barriers. This is just a sampling of the publications we've put out in recent years talking about the barriers to uh, these sorts of innovations. Uh, and there are so many that we've worked on here at Cato. I, I just want to run through a bunch of them and get your quick impressions about uh, each uh, of these sort of policy features or government interventions and the and your judgment as to whether they've had a positive or negative impact on innovation and evidence gathering, and your judgment about the size of that impact. And if we can run through these rapid fire, then we can revisit any, any that interest us uh, at the end. Uh, so I'll start with uh, clinician licensing. Rob. Um, there's, well, there's licensing and there's accreditation. Uh, the evidence on accreditation suggests that it doesn't really do much to improve quality of care. Licensing, um, I don't know if we have good evidence on the quality of care practiced by people who are licensed versus not licensed, um, but I've seen it in other countries. I wrote a book on what healthcare is like in India, and there you have both sets of practitioners, licensed and unlicensed. There's definitely a quality difference between them. I just don't know about the U.S. But, but in terms of a barrier to innovation, like a barrier to healthcare teams working together uh, to coordinate care, uh, does uh, what sort of or a barrier to uh, broader integration, such as ACOs or uh, uh, entire prepaid group practices? Right. Uh, what sort of a uh, does it have a positive or negative impact on innovation, and how, if so, how much? See, I don't think it's the licensing so much that's a barrier to innovation in those things. It's the, the cumbersome nature of these alliances that are pulled together called accountable care organizations or all these other things, which basically inhibit or prevent people from collaborating with one another. Mark, clinician licensing? Well, uh, so one of the more surreal experiences I had, I found myself eating tricolor pasta salad over at the National Academy of Sciences <laughs> talking about veterinary medicine. And the, uh, it dawned on me, because I guess I didn't realize this, that if you own the King Ranch, you don't have to worry about licensed veterinarians. You have your own vet techs, they're your cattle. You can, tell, you can hire whoever you want to care for your animals. So not that I'm, although we are cat sitting at home at the moment now, not that I'm advocating that as a model for human medicine, but the punchline is what uh, matters to the owner of King Ranch is the outcome. So if, again, this is in my Nirvana world, if we could measure the outcomes, the health outcomes, the consumer satisfaction outcomes, and so forth of healthcare organizations, especially tightly organized ones, more accurately, then I think we could make the case for um, uh, uh, diminishing some of the licensing rules and let them use people the way they find produces the best outcome as long as they would uh, meet some basic standard of acceptability. Now, speaking personally in a developed country, I wouldn't want to go to a non-licensed practitioner, but uh, from my point of view as a, a disciple of Milton Friedman, I'd rather just see them certified as licensed, not make it illegal uh, f for, uh, f uh, for, for, uh, uh, for them to practice medicine. On the third hand, now that I'm retired, you know, TikTok for the retirees is CNN, and all I see are commercials for nutraceuticals where people pretending to be experts on healthcare are telling you about uh, jellyfish extract. Maybe <laughs> there ought to be a law against that, but that's just because it's irritating. <laughs> But the uh, but the the ranch owner would be certifying uh, uh, the the ranch owner might provide the certifications that you're talking about. Well, I might but, look for certification in who they are, or even provide I, them in the in the way that some health systems are starting their own medical schools. Yeah, yes, uh, could right be, now could be. But. And so I'll take that to uh, your answer to be that it has the clinician licensing has a negative impact on innovation and maybe a significant one. Yeah, I think there are ways of, of, of uh, uh, altering things, measure outcomes rather than um, processes. Okay, uh, next, I've got a couple more here, but I'll skip to number five, which is the federal tax code. Uh, 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 the, I'm thinking primarily of the tax exclusion for employer-sponsored insurance, which has a number of features. One of them is 
that encourages, it encourages group purchasing of health insurance instead of individuals making their own health insurance decisions. And it ties health insurance to jobs. You talked in the book, uh, you, your co-authors talked in the book about how insurers might not invest in certain activities if the benefit is going to go to one of their competitors when that enrollee switches plans. How much of an impact does the federal tax code uh, and all of these um, uh, secondary effects of tax preferences for employer-sponsored health insurance or other tax preferences. How much of a barrier to innovation is that and a barrier to evidence gathering about, the, about innovations? Well, I don't know if it's a barrier to innovation, but I think it's probably a barrier to efficient innovation. Mm -hmm. And uh, one way to see that uh, is to think of uh, a, a, at least an innovative way, there has been innovation in organizing um, uh, healthcare delivery networks where different, uh, uh, you, in principle, uh, uh, and I guess now that I'm in Medicare, if I do it Medicare Advantage, I have my choice of choosing amongst a number of different delivery networks. Uh, and so do people in the private sector. And they, uh, among other things, can contract with lower cost physicians uh, or physicians whose pattern of practice is more frugal uh, and lower cost hospitals and so forth. Um, I have advocated the South Philly uh, Healthcare Network, whose motto is, we're not that great, but we sure are cheap. Do you have a problem with that? But I don't know whether I join that one myself, but my punchline is there are arrangements in terms of competing healthcare networks which can incentivize people to make better choices between cost and, um, and uh, other things that go along with their healthcare services, like um, uh, uh, access and so forth, but the tax exclusion uh, uh, mi mitigates that choice. So if I were to choose when I was back at Penn, lowest cost bare bones HMO, I could have saved a couple of thousand dollars, but I would have shared about half of that with the uh, revenuers from the feds and from the city of Philadelphia's dreaded wage tax and from the state of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So uh, maybe we should have evidence on this. If we uh, manage to soup up the uh, 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 differentiation that people could see financially in choosing among alternative ways of delivering health care that meets a basic level of quality, would that produce more cost conscious choices to borrow a phrase from Alan Entoven? I think it might, but uh, we'd like evidence rather than, but as you know, I believe the source of all good and evil in healthcare is from health insurance and the source of most evil in American health insurance is the tax exclusion, uh, which, you know, take, I used to say, take my tax break, please. But, uh, but I never really gave it away because, you know, it saved us uh, $8,000 8, a year in taxes, not have to pay taxes on that health benefits. Could I shine a management lens on your please. question? And that is, I don't, I'm not sure the problem with employer-based health insurance is its tax deductibility as it is with the reticence of employers to innovate. Um, I talked to my law school colleagues at Penn and they say, you know, the biggest bunch of enrollees people with health insurance coverage in this country are employer-based. The employers actually have quite an opportunity to do something proactive and innovative uh, to address the, the issues we're trying to deal with in the healthcare system, but they don't uh, for several reasons. They're risk-averse and they're paternalistic. And in a, a, a market and our economy where they're having trouble attracting and keeping labor, they just don't want to rock the boat. And so I think that is a bigger problem with the employer-based health insurance system. So uh, a couple of things about that. I think that, uh, Mark, again, your answer was, uh, yeah, the exclusion frustrates innovation. Um, and, and Rob, uh, it, it frustrates innovation because it uh, gives control over so much healthcare decision-making to people who are very... Um, uh, innovation or risk averse. They're not willing to, to take those risks. Um, and I, 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 you bring to mind, Mark, a, a survey that Atul Gawande did, I think, back during the 1990s, during the managed care backlash, when in, employers did try to innovate by uh, deploying more managed care tools to reduce un, uh, unnecessary utilization. And there's a huge pushback from doctors who are being excluded from networks and having bean counters override their medical judgment. And 
it, it ultimately led to legislation in many states and at the, at the federal level, and employers abandoned most of those tools. So you see, if you look at the graph of growth in health insurance premiums, it dipped somewhere in the 1990s at zero or near zero, uh, but then uh, be, uh, resumed its meteoric rise because uh, employers uh, found that it wasn't worth it. Um, and I, I would, I would, uh, it, it also so. Uh, what Atul Gawan found was that actually, in that survey, actually the people who chose their own uh, health insurance plan and then chose a managed care plan really liked those plans. There was no backlash from them, but there was uh, uh, among people, people whose employers made that choice for them against the, the, the workers' preferences. And I think that's, I think that's consonant with what, uh, what um, uh, to buttress your point, Mark, uh, Alan Enthoven found about Kaiser Permanente's attempt to enter the North Carolina market. When, uh, when they tried to do that, they ultimately, it ultimately failed. I mean, Kaiser has been a durable sort of innovation in at least some parts of the country because it is a pretty unique way of paying for and, um, uh, and, and delivering medical care. It is, uh, it is fully prepaid or capitated and it is a fully integrated delivery system as we call it so that all of the providers work for the same corporate entity. Uh, but when they tried to enter North Carolina, it failed in Alan Enthoven's judgment uh, because not enough workers faced the marginal cost, the full marginal cost of their of their health insurance premium, and uh, and so that's that's sort of why I asked if if group purchasing uh, itself might be uh, a barrier to innovation, because if Atul Gawan is right, that some people like managed care plans. Some people are open to Kaiser type plans uh, with all the innovations that, that it offers. But the, the government is effectively penalizing them $8,000, uh, to use uh, Mark's example, unless they cede that decision to an employer, then, uh, then might that be creating an even greater barrier to innovation than, uh, than most people recognize because there are lots of consumers out there who might sign up for one of those more affordable, innovative plans, but their employer is saying no, and the government is saying, we'll penalize you if you do it. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with that, although I think it's important to make a distinction. I'd make a distinction between taking away the tax exclusion, which, as you know, I would dearly love to see happen, although uh, I have a lot of windmills to tilt at, and that's <laughs> only one of them. But uh, on the other hand, uh, some people say, well, and we ought to prohibit the employer from offering group insurance. And uh, even r some uh, anti-regulation people say that. And I am skeptical of that if my employer has a good benefits department, not the kind Rob's talking about where, you know, you, you go in there and they're all asleep, but uh, you, they actually are trying to do something innovative. Then, um, you know, personally, when it comes to insurances of all types, despite my expertise, I prefer set it and forget it. I'd rather let my a good employer benefits department pick a set of good options for me to begin with, and then I'd choose the best, the one of, among them I like the best, based on a comparison of real dollar costs between the various options, if there is a variation in cost. So, so I, I think saying we shouldn't let our employers pick our insurance for you, for us, well, if you don't want to, don't work for that firm that does, but if, if you are attracted to a firm that says we have a great benefits department of kindly people, uh, then th that seems to me to be a reasonable strategy for uh, compensation on the part of employers that want to maximize profits. So, but not, not to go too far hit, uh, criticizing the saints here as opposed to the sinners, but, but uh, I, th I think, th I mean, the real problem is the economic incentives are wrong. Speaking of economic incentives, I'll have one more question, and then I'll uh, take up the uh, uh, questions from the audience and um, and and from the interwebs. Uh, in in uh, one of your chapters, Mark, you offered the example of Dr. Frank. Dr. Frank uh, is a primary care physician. Uh, he was working in a system where he gets paid a fee for each service he provides. What we call fee for service payment. So the more services he provides, the more office visits, the more patients he sees, the more money he and his colleagues get. And uh, uh, he had a patient come in with chest pains. He suspected that it was uh, a result, the chest pains were, were the result of anxiety. But because he was short on time, he referred this patient to a cardiologist. The cardiologist ran a battery of tests at some expense. 
found nothing. That patient ended up back in front of Dr. Frank, and they pursued his original hunch, which was that this was, that this was anxiety. And you question uh, whether the outcome might have been different if the way that insurers or whoever was paying Dr. Frank was instead of paying him uh, an additional fee for each additional service or office visit, and the cardiologist as well, if the purchaser, the, whoever this third party payer is, uh, paid uh, Dr. Frank a fixed amount per patient, because that would totally flip his financial incentives. If his practice, if his healthcare system bore the cost of that unnecessary cardiologist visit, we'll call it unnecessary, uh, and, and then the cost of the second visit to Dr. Frank, might that system, might Dr. Frank or that system have encouraged Dr. Frank to spend more time uh, talking to that patient, uh, ascertaining that the cause is in fact anxiety? What you find in, in or what you claim in the chapter, uh, in the chapter is that there isn't really good evidence on that. That there is not really good evidence on whether changing the way we pay Dr. Frank, one pays Dr. Frank, would change either his behavior or would uh, uh, produce better care for that patient or do so at a lower cost. Uh, but my question for you is, with all that set up for the audience, my question for you is, don't we have evidence that that sort of thing does re at least reduce uh, healthcare spending, un unnecessary healthcare spending without harming the patients? And uh, I'm thinking here of, uh, maybe the most important um, uh, health insurance study that anyone's ever done, which was the RAND health insurance experiment. Uh, a lot of people thought, this was one of the fads, that if we give everyone free health care, uh, we, we just give health care away to people without making them pay anything out of pocket, then that would improve their health. So the federal government funded this study that randomized people to uh, be in a catastrophic health plan or, or a catastrophic health plan with certain levels of cost sharing below the deductible. But there is also then an HMO arm where they put people into a prepaid or capitated uh, health and maintenance organization, much like we're talking uh, the hypothetical one that we're talking about for Dr. Frank. And what this Rand Health Insurance Experiment found was that across all of these different arms of the study, there were really no differences in health outcomes. So the patients were no worse off in, uh, under those different financial incentives, but uh, they did spend a lot less because, presumably because the chief medical officer or, or the individual uh, frontline uh, uh, primary care physician uh, felt the, the import of those incentives or maybe their approach to practicing medicine was different, whatever the case, they did less for those patients. They saved money, in some cases, uh, 30%, 25 to 30% less, uh, and it did not harm, uh, uh, the, on average, the health of those patients in the HMO arm. So the question is, Mark, isn't there evidence that those sorts of financial incentives, in fact, do produce different behaviors on the parts of, uh, part of physicians, and aren't those behaviors socially beneficial compared to the alternatives. Yeah, well, there's a lot of layers to your very long question there, Mike. Yeah. But, uh, so I guess, first of all, I would say Dr. Frank actually was writing in favor of alternative, favor of, of, of value-based payment of alternative to fee-for-service. So he was trying to show how terrible this was. My reaction was, um, I don't want him as my doctor uh, <laughs> for two reasons. One, um, he could have, if I was the person with anxiety and chest pain, he could have seen me longer. Uh, uh, he might have to change his schedule and say, I want to schedule my visits for 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes. Of course, he'd make less money, but who wants to go to such a greedy doctor that you know, they're, they're willing to um, abuse their patients just to make a little bit more money? And then my other comment was, and how does he know that it, uh, on a probabilistic basis that the cardiologist might not have found something that would have been useful if Alternatively, he referred me to the cardiologist. I'll be me because I've had anxiety and chest pain. Uh, with uh, probability one that it was a total waste of my time and the cardiologist's time, what a terrible doctor. So if they say, Dr. Frank will see you now, I'd run the other way uh, because uh, they, he doesn't sound like a very good doctor. But more generally, though, you raise the question, which we've been asking for years and years, uh, these bundled payment methods change the incentives toward reducing cost, but also taking the money and running off 
to South America, so they're not necessarily pure, but uh, Kaiser seems to make them work, at least in terms of levels of spending, although, as I said, not in terms of growth rate of spending. My own view on that is, if that's what you like, knock yourself out. Join a, an HMO that pays its physicians on a capitated basis. Um, and, um, you know, especially if you're more afraid that doctors will over-treat you than under-treat you, I don't know, different members of my family have different kind of phobias in that regard. Uh, that'll tell you which way you should go. But uh, it seems like a classic case for letting the market settle it. Uh, and what the market has said so far in California, setting aside the tax exclusion and all the other stuff is, Kaiser's got a big market share, but it doesn't have 100% market share. What put the kibosh on the HMO growth in the 1990s was not, uh, as uh, Atul Gawande's study showed, complaints by patients as complaints by physicians who are not in the HMOs and complaints by Hollywood that uh, I was once asked if I debate Denzel Washington about the merits of HMOs, and I declined. He's a lot more handsome than I am. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, my preference on this is this seems to be the perfect case for a market to settle things if provided adequate information, evidence-based information about the health outcomes and the comparative costs. And just to throw one more thing in, um, uh, w we think one of the impediments to HM, Kaiser-type expansion, and this is what Kaiser people will tell me, or my students have gone to work there, is there's a certain kind of doctor that practices well in the Kaiser system and is happy with it, and there seems to be a limited supply of physicians, at least coming out of med school, who are able and willing to go the Kaiser route. Some of them are gung-ho to do it, so God bless them, they join Kaiser, but a lot of them uh, find that uh, that uh, that's not the way they they didn't go to medical school uh, to uh, b uh, practice in such a large and um, uh, collegial group. They 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 well I don't want to cast aspersions on anybody else any more than I already have, but that that's that's the, that's my take on it. It seems like it seems like a perfect uh, case for the market to settle it. I don't think Rob or I or you or somebody on Capitol Hill. Uh, or for that matter, somebody in Sacramento, where they're actually on the case now, trying to get everybody into a Kaiser-type arrangement, uh, should make decisions on that accord. Um, I still trust the American people to make wise decisions when provided with correct information. You know, the whole Kaiser experiment is predicated on having a specific culture, which Kaiser built up since the 30s, and Kaiser can't replicate that culture in other parts of the country. Uh, and even economists are now recognizing that it's a recent merger with Geisinger. They're going to, you may have culture clash there. And so if econ when economists start talking about culture clash and all the behavioral science stuff I look at, I think, yes, we're making some progress uh, because now we're beginning to recognize that the soft, mushy stuff we call behavioral science can be very important. And uh, Kaiser's problem is that they can't replicate all the elements of their West Coast model, which historically was rooted in rural California with labor unions and things like that. It's hard to replicate those conditions, which is what we call terroir, in other parts of the country. Um, I've just got a couple more questions. So if you've got some in the audience here, uh, you might want to tee those up. Let me, uh, my two final questions, I think, will be this. First, if you could do one policy intervention that would either encourage more innovation in healthcare or would uh, uh, encourage more uh, 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 collection of evidence about what works and what does not. What would that one policy intervention be? Well, you, you know what I would say. I would get rid of the tax exclusion. And I, I guess I would say, and I want to encourage the optimal amount of innovation, not necessarily more innovation, or the optimal type of innovation, which I think I've already given arguments as to why it would point in that direction. Uh, David Cutler, my good friend, and I always have these arguments about whether the amount of waste in American health care is 30% or 3%. Uh, he believes 30%, so do most health professionals. They just can't agree on which 30% is the joke. <laughs> but I believe that the amount of pure waste, uh, people doing things that they know from the outset would be totally useless, 
uh, is much smaller than that. It's closer to 3% or maybe 6% to the estimates for the, uh, moving the ta removing the tax exclusion come up somewhere around 6 10% usually in terms of savings. Uh, but, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it may, uh, uh, if you want to know why do we spend so much more than every other country in the world, uh, it's because we pay our people better. We could stop doing that. That's not a matter of efficiency. That's a matter of equity. Uh, but, uh, but I don't want orthopedic surgeons coming after me. So uh, I'm not sure I'd advocate that. But, uh, but um, the, the main... Um, uh, it may it may be uh, as the uh, as the movie said this is as good as it gets, uh, or at least we're within six percent of as good as it gets. I think I'm closer to David uh, on that. Okay, but that, well, one of the one of the God bless you. Give it a shot. One of the impacts one of the impacts of eliminating the exclusion would be that the trillion dollars that employers now spend on health benefits would flow to the uh, the workers because it's part of well, their earnings. Well, if they if the workers wanted right, and then uh, yeah, if they who wants a trillion dollars though, but. Uh, similarly to that, um, a, a similar reform on the Medicare side would be instead of uh, having, uh, you've written the Medicare is essentially already a voucher program, although we don't call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a substitute. Well, and I call ACOs, HMOs for Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get a, a subsidy. You get a subsidy if you pick. Uh, Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare, you get maybe a different subsidy if you trick, uh, pick one of the private Medicare Advantage plans. You kind of get to decide where to take your subsidies like a voucher. Yeah. What if instead of uh, it being a voucher, it were just a cash, cash transfer program like Social Security, what sort of impact would that have? Would that have a similar impact on innovation to uh, eliminating the tax exclusion and letting workers control that trillion dollars of their earnings? That sounds like an economist question. Uh, so uh, the virtue of the reason to have a voucher is because it sets a lower bound on the amount of spending. And that's, in my view, that's a social judgment. Now that I'm on Medicare, I have different views on this. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a social judgment. Uh, but where that would be set is kind of up to um, my grandchildren. Uh, well, uh, let's say it's income and risk adjusted. If they're so. going to be ballerinas, I really feel bad they're going to be paying for my uh, Medicare at high, high prices. But... Let's say if this is coming risk adjusted, would it have a similar impact on innovation to um, to eliminating the exclusion? Uh, uh, the payment, the check that you get from Medicare. In, well, um, I'm not sure we're, we're talking in the same range. Uh, I would like to see it easier to monetize the savings that a person gets from Medicare by choosing a lower cost plan rather than having to take it in dental care. And rides to the doctor. So, a social, if it were like Social Security, they would get. Yeah, to now keep that's that going to put Joe Namath out of work. Right. <laughs> okay, yeah. so uh, Rob, policy intervention. You know, uh, the one thing that's always bugged me is that we have this. Uh, we've been doing demonstrations in Medicare for a long time, and long before we even had CMMI. And I wrote the chapter on care coordination. We had this randomized controlled trial of 15 different care coordination approaches, only one of which worked. And then the federal government pulled the plug on it and said, well, it was a demonstration. We proved that it worked, and it withdrew all the funding. And this, was, this happened in our backyard just north of Philadelphia. I thought, what a dumb... What a dumb idea. I mean, we finally found something that worked, and then they pulled the plug on I would have thought maybe we ought to have some sort of uh, formula for sustained funding of things that work. So federal funding of experiments. Experiments in, that work. In, OK. Uh, I have one more question um, uh, that's sort of related to that. But first, I'll ask if anyone in the audience has any questions they want to get in before my final one. Uh, the gentleman in the middle, please. It seems like one of the issues that you've touched on in achieving evidence-based care and by extension evidence-based management is kind of a lack of harmony in what we mean when we say outcomes. Um, for example, it seems like in the public discourse, a main outcome that's talked about is life expectancy and kind of declining life expectancy on a macro scale. Um, you also mentioned the Oregon health insurance experiment, which seems to be interpreted differently by readers depending on which outcome you focus on, whether it be physical health or mental health uh, for the people that were uh, in the treatment group. So 
in the book or in your work in general, um, are there outcomes that you gravitated towards measuring that you thought were most valuable or more valuable than outcomes such as life expectancy or even quality adjusted life years, which seems more common in the literature? Do you want to try this? Well, you know, they're, they're, I, th I think when AHRQ put together a compendium, there were 1,800 different outcome measures. And so we're, we're, um, we're stuck with what the researchers were able to study. And across all the studies, those outcome measures aren't replicated all the time. The approaches taken to studying them aren't replicated all the time. So we have a lot of unstandardized results that we're trying to sift our way through. Um, I don't know what's the best way to do it, except as we said, you know, uh, with the Kenny Rogers thing, you know, we may need to be able to gather more evidence to see where we can replicate findings using some consistent outcome measures. And I think th there's some movement to have a core number of outcome measures rather than the 1,800 or so that we're now using. Well, yeah, I'm kind of torn. On the one hand, one part of me says, well, we ought to have a competitive market in outcome measures. And, you know, there's the Zagat's Guide and the Michelin Guide. And uh, eventually, the market will settle down, and there'll only be three or four. And so rather than have someone in Washington decide, uh, I'd rather it be settled that way. On the other hand, if you ask me what I would do, and I have to run this by my wife first, but uh, <laughs> what I would probably do is look at uh, qualities first. What are the qualities from this Medicare eight? Uh, Medicare quality payment? adjusted life years. Quality adjusted life years, which includes uh, life expectancy and uh, and the quality of life. Use that as a first filter, and then of the ones that seem to give you the most qualities for your money, then look at other things that matter more uh, in a more soft way, but also can be quite important, like consumer satisfaction, turnover among members, and so forth. I think in many ways, um, since I started down that road, I'll talk about restaurants. It's kind of like picking a good restaurant. You're going to have to take a few chances, probably, and learn a little bit from experience, although the problem with healthcare is sometimes when you've learned from experience, it's too late. Uh, but uh, but, uh, the, the, but, the, uh, but you, you, it, you can't uh, imagine that uh, um, and and it's a it's a burden for consumers, and I think a lot of them would sign up for things like uh, the Washington Checkbook and things like that to kind of help them uh, f uh, work their way through all the different options. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the again, it won't be perfect. Some people will make the wrong choice, you know, and say the food was terrible and the portions were too small, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, uh, and then they'll complain to their senator or their congressman, but I think th those, are the, uh, 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 th those are the breaks when it comes to a choice in a situation where things are uncertain, which is definitely what we're talking about here. Any more questions from the audience? Um, again, gentleman in the middle. Very briefly, uh, Please wait for the microphone so that the folks at home can hear you as well. Thank you very quickly. The question about, is about prevention. I don't know if you touch it in your book. Um, at the individual level, it's very clear that uh, in terms of aging, healthy aging requires prevention, not just waiting for Alzheimer and looking for a pill. So how, what, how much evidence there is that prevention is important at the individual level? Prevention. Well, well, prevention we, in the sense of you know, not smoking, in terms of more activity, everything which is not medical. Right which includes the uh, so dreaded nutraceuticals and alternative medicine, which is people are flocking to, maybe for some good reason. So that's the question. Yeah, well, one of our Penn colleagues, Louise Russell, has basically written more than one book on this topic. And, you know, the, the evidence base for prevention, and then there's a parallel evidence base for promotion, isn't as promising as people think it is. I mean, the, it's not necessarily cost effective to engage in this stuff. I, I have people who come in and speak, on, scientists who come in and speak in my class said, well, should we let people smoke? Well, let them smoke and they'll die early at an earlier age. It won't cost as much as if we, you know, try to prevent it. And later on, you know, they develop these other kinds of diseases and they end up costing more. They're basically trade-offs. They're an ugly trade-offs. Yeah. Uh, 
So. Well, I just saw a study actually that lamented the fact that if Medicare saves lives, that's that much more we'll have to pay in Social Security. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that uh, you know, even as an economist, I'm not willing to say that. I, I do think what we what, what do we what do we have evidence on? We know that lifestyle matters. So smoking matters. Uh, body mass index matters. Uh, not skydiving matters. Things not riding a motorcycle without a helmet matters. Uh, Louise uh, 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 Russell's work suggests that uh, m most preventive medical care does not save money, yeah. which is what drives Congress people mad, because they want, in the worst way, to say, have it save money. It doesn't. I mean, few things do, like cheap pediatric immunizations, but most of the things that people aren't doing, uh, if they did them, they wouldn't save money. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, and then finally, I don't know for the geriatric set of which I guess I am now a member. Uh, it, it maybe uh, I don't know. I want to say it's too late, but the, there certainly are things that we can do that are preventive that will help improve our health. But a lot of them, as Mickey Mantle said, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Uh, that's actually <laughs> got a lot of truth in it. Uh, and so um, it, maybe it's too late, but. Uh, the idea that, uh, first of all, the idea that prevention is a panacea, silver bullet, well, I no. told you about my Orlando <laughs> visitor. No, it's not. Uh, the idea that there are a lot of preventive activities that aren't yucky, like a colonoscopy, but are easy, like a sh maybe a shot to some people, uh, that are underused is probably uh, 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 O overestimated by uh, the general public. Not, I don't want to say there aren't any. There are some where, where we, we can't quite figure out, for example, why people who've had a heart attack don't take, don't take their prescribed statins afterwards. So I don't want to be too doctrinaire here. There are a few things. If you could kind of grab them by the throat and say, look at this and look at the evidence, maybe people would start taking them more and making them free or even paying people to take them would be a good economist solution. But I think the idea that pr more prevention can reduce our healthcare spending, our healthcare spending growth in particular is probably, uh, I wish it were true, <laughs> but I don't think it is. When my father's primary care physician pesters him about statins, uh, my father says to him, you know what causes heart attacks, it's aggravation, so stop aggravating me. <laughs> yeah. And then he passes on the sentence. Yeah. So um, uh, since we're a little short on time, and I know you two have a tight schedule, I'll uh, ask my final question now, uh, which is that if you had unlimited resources to conduct any randomized controlled trial you wanted, to, uh, to ask, uh, create a, a randomized controlled trial that would answer whatever uh, question most burns at your soul, uh, what would that trial be? Uh, it could be, uh, and, and here I'm thinking either medicine itself or healthcare management or health policy. Uh, what question would you want that trial to answer? Well, I, I'm, I'm from the management side. The two biggest trends going on are horizontal integration, which are mergers and acquisitions, and vertical integration, the slide I showed you today. We have no randomized controlled evidence that either of those things work. All the evidence we have to date shows they don't work. Uh, the only thing they do is let companies get bigger. And when you say they don't work, you mean what precisely? They don't, they don't reduce costs. They don't improve quality. They oftentimes raise prices. And so it does all the things we don't want. But what it does do is make those companies bigger. And I don't mean to be politically incorrect here, but the executives get paid more. So I'd like to see a randomized controlled trial that demonstrates that. That's, that's what I saw when I saw your uh, Flying Fortresses chart. Yeah. I saw seven, uh, seven uh, companies that integrated because there were profits here, 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 and they wanted them all in one place. I should say rents rather than profits. Mark? Well, I've got two. One is a chapter we didn't have in the book, but maybe we should have, which is I would like to see an experiment in breaking up uh, hospital systems in cities that have re relatively concentrated hospitals to see if competition can work and also, of course, prevent future combinations. And I have my eye on Pittsburgh, actually. <laughs> if anybody wants to go to Pittsburgh with me and order the U University of P uh, Pittsburgh medical system to 
spin off those hospitals. After all, we broke up AT&T and look at how that worked out. So an antitrust <laughs> and randomized trust, controlled and trial. Because that's, that is the thing we have as economists, we have evidence for that it lowers spending and, um, and potentially alleviates the, the uh, otherwise irresistible urge to regulate on, on the part of the of a political sector. So that's one. The other one is, and I kind of have a point to make here, is I would like to see an evaluation of, um, of uh, evidence-based healthcare management and see whether spreading the word on evidence-based healthcare management and getting people to do more of it, this is the acid test for our book, after all, really does produce differences in outcomes to begin with, and for one thing, and then if it did, whether the outcomes are better or worse. Uh, I don't know whether we want an FDA for healthcare management. It is, it is interesting, actually, to note that you, you let off with talking about evidence-based medicine. There has been, as far as I know, no evidence on the effectiveness of evidence-based medicine. It's just a matter of faith that if doctors know more facts, they're going to treat people better. But if you chalk them full like a goose, you know, at Christmas with, uh, <laughs> with, with evidence, would they really treat people better and would there really be better health care outcomes? So uh, I write in the book a little bit at the end when I was feeling tired, but <laughs> whimsical about evidence on evidence, which um, I think if we could produce that, that would, that would help a lot with the crusade. And if anybody else uh, has a windmill they want me to talk about, <laughs> uh, about your About your first randomized controlled trial, even though there is evidence from multiple studies of what they call reference pricing or reverse deductibles when it comes to certain services, that uh, uh, the making patients fully cost conscious at the margin when they're getting a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement overcame the market power of hospitals in very concentrated markets. Uh, you'd want to... Uh, focus on antitrust and breaking up those hospitals rather than you use the consumer's natural self-interest by making, by using that innovation, which I, I think, and maybe well, you can tell me question. about whether that evidence base is worth anything. It's a question of who the you is here. So if, if a group of consumers want to get together and tell their, uh, their health plan to implement reference pricing, that would be fine with me. Uh, if the U is some regulatory authority in Massachusetts uh, implementing reference pricing, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there have been, you, you have picked a good example of something that does seem to work among the relatively few, but, uh, but it could easily, as usual, be captured by the, um, uh, by the forces of evil. Turns yeah. out it was CalPERS who did it. Well, CalPERS, which is somewhere in yeah, between yeah, well, those I two options. Cal CalPERS, uh, the yeah. California uh, Public Employment Retiree System, which is the HR department for yeah. California yeah, State of, employees. Of the California Public Employees, yeah. Um, and but, uh, sure. and Safeway and, 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 and some others. Yep, yep. Um, well, they should do more of it, yeah. But I think your, your policy intervention which would let consumers sort themselves into those plans, I think would address that. So and, and I, I think your remove, policy intervention you would obviate the, the need for your, you random, need, your first randomized controlled trial. You need to remove the tax exclusion so they can capture the full savings from that. Right. All right. And with that, I have and, to be courteous. Car Carthage must be destroyed. <laughs> And with that, I have to be courteous to our, uh, to our guests who have been very generous with their time. I want to thank them for uh, coming to speak with us today. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us here in the audience uh, and at home. If you want more, uh, if you want uh, to pick up a copy, it seemed like a good idea. If you're here at Cato, you can find some out in the uh, Winter Garden. Uh, if you want to find it online, you can find it at Amazon.com. And if you want to find more about the work that the Cato Institute has done on uh, on eliminating barriers to these sorts of innovations and gathering evidence about what works and what does not in healthcare, you can find that information at Cato.org. And I thank you very much uh, for joining us. And I want to say thank you to our, again to our speakers. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to have to.